Bible. Praise the Lord, everybody. We are so happy to be uh, back in Bible study here at Calvary Baptist Church, and we're certainly grateful for all of you who have uh, joined us. Of course, we're doing it a little different uh, for right now uh, until we're able to all get back into the sanctuary together. So we're going to do it a little different tonight. Uh, I'm going to spend a little time introducing our new Bible study series to you. And then we're going to have a little time for Q&A and our assistant pastor to, uh, for children, youth, and young adults are going to join me for that uh, portion of our time together tonight. But today I want to begin a new series, and I want to call this new series uh, Divine Designs. That's what I want to call it. I want to call it Divine Designs. And our focus is going to be on spiritual gifts. I want to tag this uh, particular series, Divine Design, because I believe that God has given every believer a supernatural ability that we call spiritual gifts. And those gifts have specific designs according to scripture. So for the next few weeks, I want to spend some time walking through a systematic plan uh, for both discovering our gifts and also walking in our gifts uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to have some time to look at the different gifts, uh, discuss what those gifts mean, and even have a time to actually figure out how those gifts fit uh, into the congregational life of the church. So I want to start with this series because, one, I believe it's going to help us in a lot of different ways. The strength of the local church depends on its members knowing and understanding their gifts. The power of every believer necessitates knowing and understanding their gifts. And the impact of the local church depends on every member knowing and understanding their gift because it's essential that every member operate in the place that God has called them to be. So that's real important for us. It's important uh, that not everybody is doing everything. So it's important for us to all be in our place, doing the things that God has called us to do and being in that right place. So again, why study spiritual gifts? We do it to strengthen the local church, uh, to empower the believer, and to better enable us to serve the people. And it is real important that you catch the last part of that, and that is nobody can do everything but everybody can do something. And so that becomes important for us. And so as we go through here, this is why I want to spend some time teaching on this subject because it's going to help us to better understand how to navigate the purpose of God for our lives in this particular season of our life. It is particularly helpful in this particular season as we're navigating some of the challenges of COVID-19 and all of that kind of stuff because uh, we still need to be in our places. We still need to be doing the things that God has called us to do. And we still need to be able to service the people uh, in the way that we are best gifted to do that. Not all of us are gifted, to, again, to do everything, but all of us are gifted to do something. And it is particularly important that people understand uh, that the church is still moving. The church is still alive. We're still functioning, even though the doors may be shut, sanctuaries may be empty. Uh, ministry still has to go on. And so that means that we all have to continue to be in our places in order to make that happen. And so as we go through this lesson, it's going to help us individually know how we can best serve the church. And let me add uh, that it will not only enhance the services of the church uh, and the kingdom, but it helps us personally to become more focused as we serve both in our local churches and in our local communities. And so it prevents us from, and this is the part that really blesses me, of knowing spiritual gifts. It, it, it actually prevents us from exerting energies in places that we've not been gifted to operate. And I think that's really important for us to understand because there are some people who are just kind of all over the place doing all kinds of things. But I think we best serve the church and we best serve one another when we're in those places that God has called us to be and we're not exerting energy in places that we've not been gifted to operate. And so our gift helps us to understand better who God has made us to be, who God has called us to be, 
and what it is that God wants us to be. So that's kind of the reasons that we want to spend some time doing this because the church is at its best when we're operating uh, in order. We're at our best when we're operating in order. Uh, and we best serve the church and the people of God when we're doing what we need to do because that particular thing is what God has called us to do. Uh, many times when I'm talking to people who have been called to ministry and they say, Bishop, I've been called to preach, uh, and they want to have that conversation, uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm always asking them is, I know you've been called to preach, I know uh, that may be your fact, but what exactly is it that God has called you to do? Because being called to preach is kind of a very generic kind of thing. Uh, what audience has he called you to minister to? Because not all ministry happens in the pulpit. Not all ministry happens uh, behind a microphone. Not all ministry happens uh, behind a camera. Some things happen uh, in street ministry, in prison ministry, uh, evangelistic areas. So ministry happens in a lot of different ways uh, all over the place. And so it becomes very important for us to understand that when God calls us, it's not just a very generic call where we're kind of left to figure out where we ought to be. But he gifts us and he prepares us uh, to do particular things in particular ways for particular seasons. Uh, my mind goes back to Jeremiah when God has this conversation with Jeremiah and his calling. And he specifically says to Jeremiah, uh, that before I formed you in your mother's womb, I ordained you a prophet to nations. And so what that says to me is God did two things. Uh, God gave him position by saying, I ordained you a prophet. And he also gave him platform by saying, I, don't, I ordained you a prophet to nations. And so he not only had a calling, but he had an audience. He not only had an assignment, but he had a a target area whereby he carries out this assignment. And so, again, as we talk about gifts, it helps us to become a little bit more specific in our approach. It helps us to be able to do the things we need to do uh, with specificity, and that becomes important. So tonight, uh, we're going to introduce it, and we're going to do some of the hard work of, of what we do in Bible study. And that is kind of go through the scriptures to help us to get a grasp and some framework on what we're trying to do. So let's look at some of the framework uh, tonight as we go through here. When we look at the subject of spiritual gifts, there are four passages of scripture uh, that provide for us a list of gifts. Uh, some of them overlap, some of them mention some, and some uh, omit some others. But we have four basic lists in the New Testament where we find a list of gifts. Uh, we have Romans chapter 12, we have 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we have Ephesians chapter 4, and we have 1 Peter chapter 4. Uh, those are the four lists that we have primarily in Scripture. Now, you may see some gifts mentioned in some different places and some different areas, uh, but these are some of the lists that we have um, in Scripture that specifically speak to spiritual gifts. Let me, let me break down, let me give you a breakdown of what you see when you look at these particular passages. In Romans chapter 12, and we're going we're gonna to spend some time tonight in Romans chapter 12, so just kind of hold on to Romans chapter 12, but let me just walk you through uh, these four particular passages on spiritual gifts. In Romans chapter 12, there are only seven gifts mentioned. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there are gifts mentioned in the earlier part of the chapter and the latter part of the chapter, and we're given some insight into how those gifts are used. In Ephesians chapter 4, you have listed the primary gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastors, and teachers. And we'll talk a little bit about that also a little later on in the study. And then finally, in 1 Peter chapter 4, we're giving, given what I call a paradigm or a model for the gifts or a model of the gifts. And that's interesting because when you look at the first Peter chapter four passage, what you're going to discover is Peter categorizes the gifts into two major categories. 
he categorizes them as number one, speaking gifts, and then number two, serving gifts. So Peter sort of sees them a little different. And so he categorizes them again as number one, speaking gifts, and number two, serving gifts. Also, when we're studying uh, spiritual gifts, we do so by how they're organized. And that's kind of what Peter had in mind when he gave his list in 1 Peter chapter 4. There are approximately 28 to 29 gifts. And I use the word approximate because it's possible that there are some others that are not as obvious as the ones we see in these four lists. So it's a little bit different. It, it, it is a little bit different. And um, there may be some gifts that uh, you hear about that you don't particularly find in any of these four lists. And that's okay. That's why I use the word approximate because there are uh, some additional gifts out there in addition to the 28 or the 29 or however you cancel, uh, however you count that. Somebody may be curious though as to why there are different lists and not one main list. So why do we have uh, these four different lists that are different uh, in their listing of gifts? Well, we're not really sure about that. The Bible doesn't, doesn't tell us why. Um, but I suspect that God may have laid them out in a particular kind of way or in a certain kind of way for us to see them from very different perspectives and then to understand how they all fit together. So what you're actually getting is you're getting uh, gifts as they're understood from different perspectives. But even though you're getting gifts from a different perspective, you're learning how they all fit together. You're learning how they all work together. You're learning how they all are brought together to accomplish a particular purpose. Um, it almost looks like, and one of the best ways for me to really explain that to you, is it almost looks like a revelation, how we receive revelation from God. Sometimes when we're dealing with revelation from God, uh, we don't get all the pieces at one time. Uh, we get uh, a little bit at a time over here, a little bit of time over there. Uh, we get what we can digest and what we can work with because sometimes uh, God has some, some great things that he's trying to reveal to us, but he understands that if he gives us the complete revelation of a thing at one time, it's too much for our humanity to digest or too much for our humanity to, to deal with. And so what God does is he gives us pieces at a time so that we can digest them and work with them. And then as we begin to manage particular portions, then he gives, some, gives us some additional parts so that we can work with that. And before long, we have all of the pieces together, and then the bigger picture is revealed. And so God doesn't, God doesn't always give it all to us at one time. He gives us a little bit of the time. He gives us enough that our faith can handle. He gives us enough that even in our human capacity that we can handle uh, and then when you begin to go back and you begin to look at those pieces, then you begin to understand the bigger picture of what God is trying to accomplish. For our time together, uh, I want us to use 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 6, as our base text. But for tonight, we're going to spend a little bit of time in Romans chapter 12. So for the entirety of the rest of our time together, as we look at divine design, we're going to spend some time in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 6, and that's going to be our base text, because I think that gives us uh, the framework for this particular series and what we're really trying to accomplish in this. And, and we're going to move around from list to list, so we'll jump back and forth between those four lists that I just gave you, but we're going to spend the majority of our time in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, and in Romans uh, chapter 12 as well. I want you to notice, for those of you who have your Bibles, hopefully you have them at home, I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 4. Hopefully you have that with you. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 4. Here's what the word of the Lord says. He says, now there are diversities of gifts. This is the King James Version. He says there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. He says there are differences of administrations, 
but the same Lord. And then he says there are diversities of operation, but it's the same God that worketh all in all. Uh, if you have a new international version, that might be a better version to approach uh, this particular text with. I'm using the King James because that's what many of you probably have access to uh, for this time of study. But he uses some different language that really makes it a little better for us. So he says there are diversities of gifts, same spirit. There are differences of administration, same Lord. There are diversities of operations. But it's the same God that worketh all in all. When you look at the context or the setting in which this passage sits, you, you, you're going to kind of need to note that uh, a few things about the context. And here's, here's one of the things that you'll need to note. In the Corinthian passage, you have to know a little bit about the history, if you will, of the Corinthian church. Uh, the church in Corinth was a very affluent church, uh, a very influential church. Uh, they have, they had really have it going on. And then to kind of add to maybe their lean toward a certain degree of arrogance, uh, we sort of understand the church at Corinth to have kind of all of the gifts operating in their church. They seem to have at least more gifts operating than any of the other churches. But at the same time, it is this particular church that with all the gifting that they have, that seems to be, they seem to be more carnal than anybody else. Uh, they have all of the spirituality available to them. They have all of these gifting available to them. But their carnality is at an all-time high. Uh, and, and because of that, it's a more confused church, and it's a messier church. Uh, they, have, they have all of these gifts uh, that they're operating in, but it seems like uh, the more that they're blessed, the messier they are. The more that God has blessed them, the more that they take a very fleshly approach uh, to spirituality. And we'll deal with that as well. Uh, from the mood of the text, though, it appears that God, through Paul, is trying to help this church really get it together because it's possible, and I need for you to catch this, it's possible to be spiritual and be carnal. i say it again. It is possible to be spiritual and to be carnal. What do you mean by that? Well, first of all, we, we kind of understand what being spiritual is. We know spirituality deals with prayer, the study of the Word of God, uh, our worship of God, our fellowship with God, uh, even how we see one another through the eyes of God. That, that's spirituality. Uh, when, I'm, when I'm operating in a sense of spirituality, I see people uh, through the image or through this concept called the Imago Dei. Uh, that's where when I'm looking at other people, I'm looking at other people, but I'm seeing the God in them. Uh, I'm seeing that they are a person who is loved by God, a person who is important, uh, a person who has human value. So when I'm looking at somebody through the eyes of God, I'm, I'm able to see that. But this word carnal means fleshly. Uh, it means fleshly. And, and that's something that we kind of need to be aware of because you're going to see Paul mention this whole idea of, of being fleshly in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 1 through 3 and it's a term interesting that he uses almost exclusively for other Christians so when he uses the term carnal or fleshly he actually uses it to describe the behavior of other Christians which suggests to me that just because you go to church doesn't make you a spiritual person. Uh, just because you even read the Bible doesn't make you a spiritual person. What, ha what, what separates you uh, from people who just go to church are people who have allowed what being in church does for them to make them better for other people. And, and that's kind of what God is getting at here because if, if all we're doing is going to church to say I went to church or are, are all of these kinds of things, eh, it kind of lacks what 
God is going after. Because it's really not about what you do in here. I think somebody says we enter to worship and we depart to serve. So it's really not, we come here as a fueling station. We come here to receive from God. We come here uh, to, be, to be supplied with what we need so that when we leave here on Sundays or Wednesdays or whenever we're here, that we're properly prepared to face whatever it is that we have to face when we leave up out of here. And, and so he uses this term carnal, interestingly, to apply to Christians in particular, that sometimes people do all of this jumping and shouting uh, and then live raggedy lives when they leave here, or, or they do all of this praising and, and talking and testifying, but it's, it's not reflected in the life they live outside of the church. That's one extreme of it, and I don't want to get into that too deeply, but it is possible to be saved and be spiritually immature. That's really what he's getting at. So as we grow in faith, we should become less attached to the things of the world. But another dimension of carnality is the misappropriation of faith. And that, 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 that's a little bit different. Because you, you've heard people talk about being so heavenly minded or heavenly minded that there are no earthly good. So carnality can be both the disconnect of our faith, but it can also be the misappropriation of our faith. Uh, it, can, it can be the disconnect of our faith where we are yet uh, operating in a sense of flesh. Uh, where we start to feel like that because we have things, it means we have more of God. Well, that's a carnal mentality. Uh, uh, just because you have money, a lot of money, don't mean you have a lot of God. Or just because you have a big house doesn't mean you have a lot of God. And so that's kind of a carnal way of thinking. But it's also the misappropriation of our faith when we start to believe that just because we don't do particular things anymore... Uh, now we begin to become condescending toward other people and we start to act like that because other people are not on our spiritual level, then there must be something wrong with their spirituality. That's the other extreme of that carnality. So there is the disconnect of our faith, but there's also the misappropriation of our faith. But then that's another lesson. Let me, let me share a couple of things with you. Uh, and then if anybody has questions, you can make sure you send them uh, to us. There, there'll be information on how you can do that. When we, look at, when we look at sort of some of the words that we need to pay attention to as we start to deal with the framework of spiritual gifts, the Greek word for gifts is charismata. It's charismata, that's the Greek word uh, for gifts. It is a grace gift. Charismata means a graced gift. It's something that God gives us not because of us, but in spite of us. It's something that he gives us not because we deserve it, but because God has a need in the earth. And he gives us to be able to meet that need, whatever that is. And we'll talk a little bit about that too, uh, because... Sometimes you, you, you will have what is called primary gifts, and sometimes you will have, uh, you will have subdominant gifts. And so we'll, we'll talk about that. Just hold on to that for a minute, and we'll come back to that. But let's get through some of the wording that helps us with the framework. Charismata. Charismata means grace gift. It means grace gift. It is an endowment. It is a spiritual ability that's given to us directly from God. It's God downloading into us, if you will. It's God downloading into us a particular ability to do a thing that we might not be naturally gifted to do, but he enables us to do it because he downloads the spiritual gift into us that allows us to function in a capacity that we're not necessarily naturally prepared for. And we'll talk about that too because one of the things that I think is important for people to understand is the difference between gifts and talents. And that's another big thing because some of the things that we call uh, gifts are really not gifts, they're talents. Uh, for, for example, for, for example uh, singing is not a gift, it's a talent. 
you can go to school and learn how to do that. You can learn how to, how to sing. And then some people are just naturally born to be able to do that. Uh, so that's not really a gift. That's a talent. That, that's a talent. But there is ministry that goes forth when you sing. That becomes the gifting part of it. The ministry that comes out of our singing is the gifting part of it. So, so sometimes there can be the, the commingling, if you will, of gifts and talents, but you have to know the difference. And the, one of the easiest ways to do this is this. If you can be taught to do it by another human being, that's a talent. That's a good way to look at that. If you can go to school to learn how to do it, that's a talent. If it's something that you have just been exposed to in your family life and you've kind of picked it up uh, as you've grown up, that's a talent. Anything that you can learn or are given uh, through uh, human uh, means is a talent. That's a talent. Uh, gifts are things that are supernaturally downloaded into us. For example, prophecy. Well, prophecy is something that you can't learn to do. You can't go to school, quote unquote, to do that. Uh, that's something that you have to depend on God to give you the information for in order for you to be able to do that. So, so the word gifts comes from that Greek word charismata. Charismata means grace gift. Again, that's important for you to understand because the fact that it is a grace gift means that God gives it to us. Uh, at his discretion. You got to know that. You got to understand that. You got to get it. God gives it to us at his discretion. It is not determined by us, but it is determined for us. It is not something we, it's not some buffet that we walk through and pick out what we want. But God knows what he needs in a particular time, in a particular house, for a particular reason. And he gives people to be able to do those particular things so that the house of God, the local church, and even the kingdom of God can be blessed. And so the thing to remember is it is a grace gift. It pretty much has nothing to do with us. It's not something that we qualify for. It's not something that we fill out an application for. But it is something that God gives us at his discretion. And then Paul mentions this other term, service. This term service uh, in this Corinthian passage, he mentions this word service, and it comes from the Greek word diakonian. It comes from this Greek word diakonian. That's the Greek word for service. And it's from that term that we get the word deacon. That's where we get the word deacon. And it literally means a waiter of tables. That's what it means. It means a waiter of of tables. It means, uh, you know what happens in a restaurant. When you walk into a restaurant, uh, you go to a table, a waiter comes to your table, the waiter asks you, um, how can I serve you or what can I get for you? You give them your order, the waiter goes back, takes care of your order, brings it back to you. Well, in, in, in this context, it's the same thing. People come to church with particular needs. They come to church with particular needs. And if we are good at what we do, that means we're paying attention to the people. And if we're paying attention to the people, then we know what the people need because we are interacting with the people. We have relationship with the people. And because God has put particular giftings in the church, then the church is able to go back like a waiter does when the waiter goes to the kitchen, comes back, brings the person who's sitting at the table what they need. Well, that's what we do as servants in the church. We find out what the needs of the people are. We go and we seek God for them, and then he gives us or he downloads the gift into us so that we're able to go back to the people and give the people what they need. So it's important that we understand this because if we're not meeting the needs of the people, then we're really not the church that God has called us to be. Uh, we can't just be about the business of gathering a couple of days of a week uh, and everybody just leaving and going on about their business and people's needs are not being met. Because when people come in our churches, they come in with all kinds of hurt, all kinds of pain, uh, all kinds of, of degrees of discouragement and depression and frustration. And, and some people just come uh, because 
they, they need a closer walk with God. They need a better relationship with God. Well, those of us who call ourselves leaders in the church ought to be equipped to be able to speak to those things. We ought to be able to pray for people. We ought to be able to talk to people. We ought to be able to have some insight into people's lives. We ought to be able to bless them in certain ways. We ought to have access to divine revelation so that people can be blessed to do that. And so, and so when, we, when we look at this word service, it's, 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 it's that term of waiting on tables. It's serving the people. It, it's not about being seen. It's not about being in front. It's about making sure that when people leave our presence, they're better than they were when they came in the door. It's about when people leave our church, they're in a better shape, a better frame of mind than they were when they came in the door. That's what service is about. It's about being a blessing to the people. And then there's a third word that he uses called uh, working. Workings, that's the other word that he used. Uh, the Greek term for workings is, is, is right there. It's called energmaton. That's the Greek word, energmaton. And it literally means energy. It's, it's where we get the uh, English word energy. And I like that because here's, here's what that implies. Watch this, here's what that implies. That implies that your gift has effect. Let's try it again. That means your gift has effect. That means that your gift produces results. And remember what I said a few minutes ago. What I said a few minutes ago is this. Uh, when people come with a need, God downloads into us the gift that we need in order to minister to that need. And the effect of that is people are made clearer. People are are feeling a little better, they have a little bit more purpose and direction in their life, all of those kinds of things happen. So there's an effect. It's not just you doing some stuff and, and moving on along, but it's about people, there that, that being an effect on the lives of people as they begin to go through this. So Paul provides us with the framework for understanding, discovering, and operating in spiritual gifts. So as believers... We all have at least one gift. Every believer, every saved person has at least one gift. And some people, you will discover, has several gifts. So right off the bat, that means that we all have a space of operation. We all have a space of operation. It means that we all have something to contribute uh, that's real important because when you understand it that kind of way, you understand that we all have value. It doesn't matter whether you sit in the front or the back. We all have value. It doesn't matter whether you have a title or not. We all have a value because we've all been gifted in one way or another by God. So that means we all bring something to the table. Now, what you bring to the table may not be what I bring to the table or what your neighbor brings to the table, but we all bring something to the table. And because we all bring something to the table, it makes all of us have value. Uh, and so, and so I, I believe I was reading somewhere in the, in the history of this church uh, that my predecessor, Apostle Avon, used to, used to declare that this is a church where everybody is somebody, where everybody is somebody. That means, that means, that means that because everybody is somebody, that means all of us have value. So it doesn't matter where you sit, uh, what you have, what your title is, that means that we're all important. All of us are important because we all bring something. And the thing I like about spiritual gifts is this, since we all don't have all of them, and but all of us have some of them, that means that we all need each other because there are some gifts I have you don't have. And there's some gifts you have that I don't have. And because I don't have it, that means I'm going to have to lean on you sometimes. And that means you're going to have to lean on me sometimes. That means I'm going to have to come to you sometimes and you're going to have to come to me sometimes. God understands what he's doing. He knew if he, give, if he gave one person every gift, he knew that would just become the most arrogant, narcissistic person. You, and some people will lead you to believe that they do have them all. But nobody has all of them. 
We, we, we all have some of them. And as far the perfecting of the saints, the work of the ministry, the edification of the body of Christ, I wish somebody could understand that today because it is important that we get away from this, this, this thing of, of, of belittling and being condescending. You don't know, you don't know when you're going to need what somebody else has. You, you don't know you don't know when you're going to need somebody to pray for you. You don't know when you're going to need somebody to talk you off the edge of a cliff. You don't know when you're going to need somebody to help you turn your life in a different direction than it's going. So it behooves us, it behooves us to not be condescending, to not be arrogant, but to love people, to respect people for the spaces and places in which they serve. That, that, that's just important. I'm going to need to get off on that, but it's just important that we understand service because I don't think the church really understands service like we need to understand service. We pick and choose who we want to serve. We pick and choose how we want to serve, uh, but we don't understand that, that God needs all of us on our A game all the time. It's not just when we need to service the people we like or our friends or, or the folk that go to church with us. But that may be some people you don't even know their name. That may be some people that you, 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 you don't even see or even speak to on a, on a regular basis. Who may, God may send them your way because he's gifted you with what they need. And when he sends them to you, he's downloaded into you what it is that they need. And so you ain't got to know their name to pray for them. You ain't got to know their name to minister to them. You ain't got to know their name to encourage them. All you need to know is God has given you what you need in order to be a blessing to somebody else. And so that becomes very important. So, so the question for us is, are we using what God has given us? And are we using it to be a blessing to the kingdom, to the body. You got to be careful that you understand that your gift is not for you. It's for other people. Say it again. Your gift is not for you, but it's for other people. If the only thing, if the only, if, if the only person that's benefiting from you being gifted then that means you're out of order in the operation of your gift. Other people ought to be blessed because you have a gift of prophecy or a gift of help or a gift of giving or a gift of faith or whatever gift you may have. That's not for you. That's for other people to benefit from. And so the question is, are we using what we've been given? Are we using what we've been given? Now, I want to stop right there uh, uh, our assistant pastor to children, youth, and young adults are going to join me here, and we're going to just have a conversation uh, at that particular point uh, because this is what this is really about, is making sure that we are using what we've been given. And we'll talk a little bit about that, and then we'll move into some of the, some of the other areas uh, that we want to finish, and then we're going to wrap up our time together tonight and pick up. Uh, from that point. Uh, take about a two to three minute break and then we'll give you a chance to get your questions posted on Facebook Live and then we'll come right back with Bishop so that he can answer your questions. Thank you.
All right. Well, we certainly welcome you back to our Wednesday night Bible study where we are discussing divine design, discovering and deploying your spiritual gifts. So as we said, uh, we want you to go ahead and post your different questions that you may have for Bishop Thomas around spiritual gifts. And we saw that there are some questions that's coming through. So we are going to jump right on in. So Bishop, one of the questions that came through is, if a person desires to be de begin discovering what their spiritual gifts are, where do you recommend they start? One of the, one of the good places to start is right here, uh, what we're doing right here, right now, and that's kind of talking through it and kind of really understanding uh, the framework, what gifts are, because sometimes I think it's, I, I, well, I always think it's important that we are, that we understand what we're talking about. Uh, and that we understand very clearly what we're talking about. Because again, as I said in the opening of our time together tonight, uh, people confuse talents and gifts. And so I really think it's important that people really understand what a gift is, that it is a grace gift, that it is something that God downloads into us specifically to be able to supernaturally do what we're not naturally able to do. So just being a part of this Bible study is one of the great places to start one of the other things that we'll be doing as we move through here is we'll be giving people an opportunity to fill out what we call a spiritual gifts inventory. And as you fill out that inventory, um, it's kind of a natural means of getting to a spiritual reality, if you will. So they'll be able to fill it out and then we'll have a chance as we get closer to the end of the series to talk about uh, what that means and how you interpret that uh, and how you actually find your place uh, in the local church and how to operate in the local church. But that's, that's a good place to start right here in yeah. this Bible study. That's, that's a good place to start. Awesome. Thank you, Bishop. Very good question and very great answer as well. Now, here's a good one. I, I saw this one earlier, and, and I definitely said I wanted to get to this one. Can I lose my spiritual gift once I have received it, and can unbelievers have spiritual gifts? Now, that's a good question. Um, losing gifts, I don't believe you can. Uh, I, I've often heard people talk about if you don't use it, you lose it. Uh, but I think um, that kind of discounts God when you believe something like that. Because before God gives you something, he knows what you're going to do with it. Right. Yep. And I believe that the, the Bible says the gifts and the callings of God comes without repentance. So that, that literally means that, that when God gifts us to do certain things, he already knows what we're going to do with it when he gives it to us. So losing it, eh, I'm, not so, I'm not so sure about that particular concept. But now when you talk about unbelievers having gifts, I don't believe that happens either. Now, what I will tell you is I believe that there are um, worldly, if you, weigh, if you will, there are worldly um, versions of spiritual gifts. Yeah. And I give you a good example of that. Um, in church or in, in the kingdom, uh, we call uh, insight into future, yes. if you will. Right. We call that prophecy. Yep. We call that prophecy. So if, if somebody, uh, if God gives us a word for somebody about things that are happening or things that are going to happen or things that have happened, that's prophecy. Mm -hmm. Well, the world's version of prophecy is fortune telling. Yes, that's right. Or, 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 what they call it, tarot card readings and all of that kind of stuff. So I believe that the world has their version of what we call spiritual gifts. Uh, but I don't believe an unbeliever because I believe spiritual gifts require that relationship. It requires that connection with God. So I don't think, I don't think unbelievers have yeah. spiritual gifts. They may have a version, yeah. but not this version. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. glad you touched on that because... Uh you'll hear a lot of believers saying, how can an unbeliever have a prophetic gift? Right. How is it that they can see into things? And as you said, there's a version of it, right. but they're not endowed with that gift. So I'm, I'm glad you touched on that one there. Yeah. Um, to kind of go in line with that, uh, someone asked the question, if I have multiple gifts, can I use them all at the same time, or are they supposed to be spread out for specific times and places? That's another good question, and I would say the answer to the question is you can use multiple gifts simultaneously. It really depends on, it really depends on what you're doing. For example, uh, in preaching, in preaching there's an aspect of preaching that declares. Mm -hmm. 
but there can also be a part of that message that's prophetic in, in that it speaks to something uh, in particular. Uh, and then there can be an evangelistic component to that. Uh, and all of that can happen within the confines of just that one sermon. Yeah. So I think it depends on the context that you're in. It depends on what's really happening, what's really going on. Because God may need you to be doing several things at a time. He may, may, he may need you to be doing that uh, at a time. I'll give you another example real quick. You can be, uh, for example, uh, praying for somebody, praying for the healing of somebody. Uh, and at the same time, there may be other people present in the room while you're praying for the healing of an individual. There may be other people in the room who are not saved. So there could be evangelism going on cool. yeah. while you're praying a prayer of healing over somebody. Yeah. So, so yeah, I believe that uh, multiple gifts can work simultaneously in the same setting or in the same context at one time. Yeah. Awesome. To tie into that, someone asked, does every gift, and you talk about this a little bit, fit into one of those categories? You talk about the five-fold ministry, apostle, mm -hmm. prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, or are there more? I would probably need them to ask that question in a different kind of way uh, in, order to, in order to answer it probably the way it needs to be answered. It yeah. probably needs to be asked in a different kind of way. Um, but I don't believe that all of the gifts necessarily fall into those categories. But I will say that every gift exists in those categories. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Yeah. But yeah, every gift exists in those categories. Um, but I don't think that it's just limited to those right. categories because you do have some that may fall, you know, kind of outside of that, yeah. outside of that realm. Uh, I do think it's important that people understand, though, that that if you're operating in what they call the fivefold ministry gifts, and that's argumentative depending on who you ask. Some people believe it's fourfold. Some people believe it's fivefold. Yeah. Depends on who you ask. But uh, when you start talking about fivefold ministry, I think uh, all of those giftings are present they, they are present yeah. but I don't think everybody and everybody's gifting falls within that yeah. you know that five-fold ram there yeah yeah mm -hmm. well really good um, and I know you touched a lot on the different uh, talents and, and gifts and I actually took some notes as well so I'm going to go to my notes while we wait for a few more to come in as well mm-hmm mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and as we, you know, as we continue to talk about it, like I said, hopefully people will stay tuned and stay with us throughout this whole series because a lot of these things, I think, are, are going to become clearer. Yep. I think we're going to begin to operate with some, some sense of, uh, of clarity about what spiritual gifts are, what they do, how they're used, how they're purposed in the church, and how people are placed in the church according to their gift. Mm -hmm. So you had mentioned you were talking about uh, gifts and talents. You said ministry, or, or paraphrasing, ministry comes out of our talents. Mm -hmm. When ministry comes out of our talents, that's a gift, mm -hmm. um, and it's used at God's discretion. One of the examples you used um, was singing. Right. I'm not much of a singer, but I can right. go get some singing <laughs> lessons, and that right. would be a talent because right. I worked on that. Right. Um, but when God decides, I'm going to use you in right. that area for ministry, right. that's where it's a gift. Can right. you kind of expound upon that a little bit more? One of the things that we, we understand, for, for example, some people are trained singers. They've, they've been to school. They, they, they know all of the technique and skill of singing. But well, you didn't get that from God. You got that from a teacher in a classroom, at a school, somewhere. They taught you how to do that. Um, so that's not a gift because it was, it, was, it was gained through a natural means. Now, once you're up singing, the gift can come through that. It can come through. But we need to be careful that we don't confuse um, that we don't confuse technique with anointing. I think that's where I want to go. I think it's important that we don't confuse technique with anointing. And I think that's where the confusion comes. Um, because you can get somebody who can sing technically correct and not bless anybody. But you can get somebody who's, mm, they don't know all the technique, but they know God. They, they don't know technique, but they got anointing. Yeah. 
and really bless people. And I think we got to be careful because one of the things I think is happening in the church is I think uh, sensationalism has crept into the church. And even the people in the church have become so enamored by technique that we no longer recognize anointing. We, we, think, that, we think that because the technique was right, um, that that was, that somehow became this precursor for anointing. Well, that's not necessary. Um, there, was a, there was a story of two people, and I'll tell it real quickly because we're getting ready to go off the air, but uh, there, were, there were two people uh, there was a, a person who had these great oratorical skills, um, and they were both invited to just read uh, and share um, the 23rd Psalms. And the person with these great oratorical skills got up, and, and they read it with all of the right intonations and, and all of those kinds of things. And, and the people were impressed, and they clapped, and they you know, applauded the person who, who did it. But then this, this, this old church mother they invited to get up. And she got up, right. and she quoted the 23rd yeah. Psalms. And by the time she finished, people were in tears. Yeah. People were in the floor. They were in a posture of worship. Yeah. And so the thing, what was the difference? The difference was the difference between technique yeah. and anointing. Right. Some people just got technique. They ain't got no anointing. Yeah. I'll just leave that right there. I'll, I'll just leave that one right there. Awesome. Well, Bishop Thomas, thank you. And we thank you guys as well for submitting your questions. And even though we're ending our session for tonight, Bishop Thomas will be picking it back up next week as well. So continue to send your questions via Facebook Live so we'll be ready for next week with any questions we have. Bishop, you want last? Yes. Again, thank you all for joining us. This is kind of going to be our platform uh, moving forward until we're all able to get back uh, in the sanctuary together. Let me go on and invite you to join us uh, Sunday, 9.30 a.m. on our YouTube for praise, worship, and preaching. We've certainly been, been blessed in our services. Uh, even though sanctuary has been virtually empty, the presence of the Lord has been strong in the place. It's been real strong in the place, and we're so grateful for that. We're so grateful for that. So join us this Sunday, and hopefully you'll be encouraged, 9.30 on our YouTube. Let me pray for you before we leave today. Your head is bowed. Father, we thank you today for our time together tonight. We thank you for uh, leading us and guiding us through our study tonight. We take certainly no credit because you are the real teacher. We're just a vessel. And so, Father, we pray that you'll continue to bless every person uh, that's watching, those who will tune in. We pray, God, that we will have clarity in teaching and people will have clarity and understanding. And even as we go through and we try to navigate uh, these chaotic waters of COVID-19, God, I pray your protection over the people of God. I pray, God, that you will bless us and keep us and cover us with your blood. Let your blood be applied to the doorposts of our house so that no evil may befall those who dwell therein. God, I pray uh, that you'll continue uh, to bless us, bless our families, bless those who are connected with us. Those that's been impacted, God, we pray for strength for them. We pray for encouragement for them. God, we pray that you will keep them focused and that you will not let their fear get the best of them, but they'll continue to operate in faith. We thank you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.